Welcome back, everyone, to Cube Super Cloud 22. I'm John Furrier, your host. Got a great influencer, Clouderati segment with Sarbeet Joal, cloud influencer, cloud economist, cloud consultant, cloud advisor. Sarbeet, welcome back, Cube alumni. Good to see you. Thanks, John, and nice to be here. <laughs> now, what's your title? Cloud consultant, analyst? Consultant, actually, yeah, I'm launching my own um, business right now, form formally yeah. soon. It's in stealth mode right now. We'll, we'll be okay. out. Well, I just call you cloud guru, cloud influencer. You've been great. Friend of the Cube, you're really powerful on social. You share a lot of content. You're digging into all the trends. Um, super cloud is a thing. It's getting a lot of traction. Uh, we introduced that concept last reInvent. We were riffing before that, yeah. kind of as we kind of were seeing the structural change that is now super cloud. It really is kind of the destination or outcome of what we're seeing with hybrid cloud as a steady state into the, what's now they call multi-cloud, which is kind of awkward. It feels like it's default, like multi-cloud, multi-vendor, but super cloud has much more of a comprehensive abstraction around it. Um, what's your thoughts? As you said, as Dave says, says that too, that the super cloud has a, that uh, abstraction sort of built into it. It's built on top of cloud, right? So uh, it's being built on top of the CapEx, which is being spent by you know, likes of um, AWS and Azure and Google Cloud and many, many others, right? So it's leveraging that infrastructure and building software stack on top of that, which is, which is a platform, I, I, I see that as a platform being built on top of you know, infrastructure as code. It's another platform which is not native to the cloud providers, so it's a, like a kind of cross-cloud platform. That's yeah, what I see. VMware calls it that cloud, cross-cloud. I'm not a big fan of the name, but I get what they're saying. Uh, we had um, a, sex, a segment on earlier with Adrian Cockcroft, Lori McVitie, and Chris Hoff, all part of the cloud already like us, ourselves, and, and, and you've been involved in cloud from day one. Remember the OpenStack days, early yeah. cloud, AWS when they started. We saw the trajectory and we mm -hmm. saw the change. And, and I think the OpenStack in those early days were, were tell signs because you saw the movement of API first, but Amazon just grew so fast. And then Azure now is catching up. Um, their CapEx is so large that companies like Snowflake, like why should I build my own? I just sit on top of AWS, move fast on one native cloud, then figure it out. Seems to be one of the playbooks of the super cloud. Yeah, that is true, and there are reasons behind that. And the, I think number one reason is the, the skills gravity, what I call it. The developers and or operators are trained on sort of one set of APIs. And I, I have said that many times, to, to out-compete your competition, you have to out-educate the market. And we know which cloud has done that. Yeah. We know what traditional vendor has done that. In the 90s, it was Microsoft. They had VB as number one language, and they were winning. So in, in the cloud era, it's AWS. They, their marketing efforts, their go-to-market strategy, the, the micro nature of like releasing the micro uh, sort of features, if you will, almost every week there's a new feature. So they have got it, you know? Yeah. And um, other two are trying to mimic that and they're having a little trouble. Like, yeah, and I think GCP has been struggling compared to the three. Uh, in native cloud on native, as you're right, com completely successful. Azure caught up and you see the Microsoft, I think is a, a great selling point around multiple clouds. And the question that's on the table here is, um, do you stay with a native cloud or you jump right to multi-cloud. Now, multi-cloud by default is kind of what I see happening. Well, we've been debating this, love to get your thoughts because yeah. you know, Microsoft has a huge install base. They've converted to Office 365. They even throw you know, SQL databases in there to kind of give it a little extra bump on the earnings. But I've been super critical on their numbers. I think their shares are, are there's over, clearly overstating their share, in my opinion, compared to AWS as a native cloud. Azure though is catching up. So you have customers that are happy with Microsoft and are going to run their apps on Azure. Yeah. So if a customer has Azure and Microsoft, that's technically multiple clouds. Yeah, true. And it's I, not I, a strategy, it's just an outcome. Yeah, I see, I see Microsoft Cloud as you know, friendly to the internal developers, you know, internal developers of enterprises. But AWS is a lot more ISV friendly, which is the software shops friendly, right? So that's what they do. They just build software and give it to somebody else. But if you're an in-house developer and you have been in a Microsoft shop for a long time, which, which enterprise haven't been that, right? So they have, Microsoft is well entrenched into 
the enterprise. We know that, right? Yeah. For a long time. Yeah, and so, the, the old joke was developers love code and just go with a lock-in, and then ops people don't want lock-in because they want choice. Yeah. So you have the DevOps movement that's been successful, and then you get DevSecOps. The real focus to me, I think, is the operating teams because the ops side is really with the pressure is serving. I want to get your reaction because we're seeing kind of the, the, the script flip. DevOps worked, infrastructure as code has worked. We don't yet see security as code yet. Yeah. Um, and you have things like um, cloud native services, which is all developer goodness. So I think the developers are doing fine. Give them a thumbs up and open source is booming. So they're shifting left, CI CD pipeline. There's some issues around repo, you know, mono, monolithic repos, but devs are doing fine. It's the ops that are now have to level up because that seems to be a hot spot. What's your take? Do you, what's your reaction to that? Do you agree? And if you if you say you agree, why? Yeah, I think devs uh, are doing fine because they, some of the devs are going into ops. Like the, the whole sort of movement behind DevOps sort of culture is that devs and, and ops are is one team. The people who are building that application, they're also operating that as well. But that's very far and few in enterprise space. We know that, right? Big companies like Google, Microsoft, um, uh, Amazon, Twitter, those guys can do that. They're very tech savvy shops. But when it comes to, if you go down from there to the second tier mm -hmm. of enterprises, they, they are having a hard time with that. Once you create software, I've said that, I sound like a broken record here. <laughs> so once you create software, a piece of software, you want to operate it, you're not always creating it, especially when it's in-house software development. It's not your core sort of competency to, you're not giving that software to somebody else, or there are not multiple tenants of that software. Yeah. You are the only like user of that software as a company. So, or, or maybe maximum to your employees and partners, right? But that's where it stops. So there are, there are those differences and in, in, in when it comes to ops, we have to still differentiate the ops of the big companies, which are tech companies, pure tech companies, and ops of the traditional enterprise. And you are right, the ops of the traditional enterprise are having tough time to cope up with the ch changing nature of things. And because they have to run the old traditional stacks, whatever they happen to have, you know, SAP, Oracle, financial, whatnot, right? Thousands of applications, they have to run that. And they have to learn on top of that new scripting languages to, to operate the new um, stack, if you will. So for ops teams, do they have to spin up operating teams for every cloud, specialized tooling? There's consequences to that. Yeah, there's, there's economics involved. The process, if you are learning three cloud APIs, and most probably you will, you are ending, end up spending a lot more time and money on that, number one. Number two, there are a lot more uh, problems which can arise from that, you know, because of the, the dif uh, differences in the API, how the APIs work. Um, the, versus if you pick one primary cloud and then you're focused on that and most of your workloads are there and then you go to the secondary cloud, or cloud number two or three on as need basis, yeah. I think that's the right approach. Well, I want to get your take on something that I'm observing and again, maybe it's because I'm old school, I've been, been around the IT block for a while, I'm observing the multi-vendor Vendors kind of, as Dave calls the, you know, calisthenics, they're out in the market trying to push their wares and convince everyone to run their workloads on their infrastructure. Multi-cloud to me sounds like multi-vendor. And I think there's, there might not be a problem yet today. So I want to get your reaction to my thoughts. I see the vendors pushing hard on multi-cloud because they don't have a, a native cloud. Yeah. I mean, IBM ultimately will probably end up being a SaaS application on top of one of the CapEx hyperscales, and uh, some say. Um, but I think the playbook today for customers is to stay on one native cloud, run cloud native hybrid, go in on one cloud and go fast, yeah. right? Then get success and then go multiple clouds versus having a multi-cloud set of services out of the gate. Because you know, if you're VMware, you'd love to have cross cloud abstraction layer, but that's lock-in too. Yeah. So buy, what's your lock-in? Success in the marketplace or vendor access? It's tricky actually, I, I've said that many times that you don't wake up in the morning and say like, we're going to do multi-cloud. Nobody does that by choice, right? So it falls into your lap because of mostly because of MNAs and sometimes because of the you know, price to performance ratio is better somewhere else for certain kind of workloads. That's like far and few, 
to be honest with you. That's that's what my read is. That being a developer and operator of many sort of systems, if you will. Um, and the the third tier is that the which we talked about during the VM world, I think 2019, that you want vendor diversity. Just in case one vendor goes down or it's broken up by feds or something, and you want another vendor, maybe for pri price negotiation tactics or That's or an ops mentality. Yeah, yeah. So And that's true, they want choice. They don't want to get locked in. You want choice because, and also like, things can go wrong with the provider. We know that. we we. we we focus on top three cloud providers, and we sort of assume that they will be there for yeah. <laughs> next 10 years or and, so at and least. And what's also true is not everyone can do everything. Yeah, exactly. So you have to pick the provider based on all these sort of three sets of high high level criteria, if you will, and it, it's, it's, I think the multi-cloud should be your last choice. Like you should not be gearing up for that by default, but it should be by design, as Chuck said. Okay, so Dell. I need to ask you, what does super cloud, in your in my opinion, look like five, 10 years out? What's the outcome of a good super cloud structure? What's it look like? Where did it come from? How did it get there? What's your take? I think super cloud is getting born in the absence of having standards around cloud. That's what it is. Um, because we don't have standards, we, we long or we want the, the services at different cloud providers Right, uh, which have same APIs and there's less learning curve or, or almost zero learning curve for our developers and operators to learn that stuff. Snowflake is one example and, and VMware stack is available at different cloud providers. That's its sort of infrastructure as a service uh, example, if you, if you will. And Snowflake is a sort of uh, data warehouse example and they're going down the stack a little bit and you know, they're trying to expand. So there are many examples like that, right? So. It's, uh, did that, what was the question again? Is, is, is SuperCloud 10 years out? Yeah, what's 10 it, years what's out. What's it look like? Yeah, I, 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 what's I think, the components? Yeah, I think the SuperCloud 10 years out will, will expand because we will expand the software stack faster than the hardware stack. And, and hardware stack will be you know, expanding, of course, with the, the custom chips and all that. There was a the huge event yesterday was happening from AWS. Yeah, the silicon. Uh, silicon uh, day. And that's an eye-opening sort of um, movement in the whole sort of uh, technology consumption era, if you will. Yeah. The new, and they got this stacks. differentiation with the chips and, and they're, with supply chain kind of hurting right now, we think it's going to be a forcing function for more cloud adoption because if you can't buy networking gear, you got to go to the cloud. Yeah, so SuperCloud, to me, it, in 10 years, it will be bigger, better, and the likes of HashiCorp, actually, I, I, I think we need likes of HashiCorp on the infrastructure as a service side. I think they will be part of the SuperCloud. They are kind of sitting on the side right now, mm -hmm. um, kind of a good vendor lost in transition kind of thing. Yeah. I, that, that's I mean, it's like doing. Kubernetes, we'll just close out here, we'll make a statement. Mm -hmm. Is Kubernetes a developer thing or an infrastructure thing? It's an ops thing. I mean, you know, people are coming out and saying Kubernetes is not a developer issue. It's ops thing. It's an I mean, ops thing, I it's orchestration, it's yeah. under the hood. So you're in this infrastructure as a service, integrating this super pass layer, as Dave Vellante and Wikibon call it. Yeah, it's an ops thing, which actually, which enables developers to to get that, that as a service. You know, like you can deploy your software in, in sort of different format containers, and then you don't care like what VMs are those. And but serverless is the, mm. sort of rising as well. It was hot for a while. Now it's like <laughs> a lull state. But I think serverless will be better in next three to five years. Well, ago. certainly the hyperscalers like AWS and Azure and others have had great CapEx investments. They need to stay ahead. In your opinion, final question, how do they stay ahead? Because AWS is not going to stand still, nor will Azure. They're pedaling as fast as they can. Google's trying to figure out where they fit in. Are they going to be a real cloud or a software stack? Same with Oracle. You know, to me, it's really, you got the big race now with AWS and Azure. Azure's nipping at their heels. Um, right. Hyperscalers, what do they need to do to differentiate going forward? I think they are in a limbo. They, they, on one side, they don't want to compete with their 
you know, customers who are sitting on top of them, likes of Snowflake and, and, and others, right? And, and VMware as well. But at the same time, they have to, you know, start, uh, keep sort of expanding and, 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 and keep innovating. And they are kind of, look, they are deciding, they're debating within their, themselves, like, should we compete with these guys? Uh, should we launch similar sort of uh, features and functionality, or should we keep it open? And what I have heard as of now, that internally at AWS especially, yeah. they're thinking about keeping it open yeah. and letting people sort of Yeah, and you see them the buying some, you know, the Cerner with Oracle that bought Cerner, Amazon bought a healthcare, Amazon bought a healthcare company. I think the likes of MongoDB, Snowflake, Databricks are perfect examples of what we'll see I think on the AWS side, Azure, I'm not so sure. They, have, they like to have a little bit more control at the top of the stack with the SaaS, but I think Databricks, has been so successful with open source. Snowflake a little bit more proprietary and closed than Databricks. Uh, they're doing well as on top of it. And MongoDB has got great success. All of these things compete with AWS higher level services. So, so that, that advantage of those companies not having the CapEx investment and then going multiple clouds on other ecosystems, that's a path of customers. Stay one, go fast, get traction, then go. That's huge actually. The last um, sort of comment I want to make is that Dave also, and, and you also, you guys include this um, uh, in the definition of super cloud, the, the likes of uh, Capital One and Sonar kind of sort of, uh, sort of uh, vendors, right? So they are verticals, they are, uh, Capital One is in this financial vertical, and then Sonar, uh, which Oracle bought, they are in this healthcare vertical. And remember in the beginning of the cloud, in the, when the cloud was just getting born, we, we, we used to say that we will have the, com the um, community clouds, right? Which we, which will be serving different verticals, specialty clouds, specialty clouds, yeah. community clouds, and that is actually that that is happening now at, at very sort of small level. But I think it will start happening at, at a bigger level. You know, the the Goldman Sachs and others are trying to build these services. The, on the on the financial front, you know, risk management and whatnot, yeah. uh, I think uh, that will that will be. Well, what's interesting, built in bring, what you're bringing up a great discussion. We were having discussions around these vertical clouds, like Goldman Sachs, Capital One, Liberty Mutual. They're going all in on na one native cloud, then going to multiple clouds after. But then there's also especially the clouds around especially clouds around functionality, app identity, data security. So you have multiple 3D dimensional clouds here. You can have a specialty cloud just on identity. Yeah, I mean, identity on Amazon is different than Azure, huge issue. Yeah, I think we have to, at, at some point, we have to distinguish these things which are being built on top of these infrastructure as a service and pass, which is a platform as a service, which is very close to infrastructure as a service, like the line, lines are blur, blurred, from, we have to distinguish these two things from these super clouds, actually we, what we are calling super cloud, maybe it will be a better term, better name, but, we can't, we are all industry pundits actually, including myself and you or everybody else, like we tend to mix these thing, things up. I think we, we have to sort of separate these things a little bit to, yeah. to make I them. Think, I think that's what the super pass things up because you think about the next generation SaaS has to be solved by innovations of the infrastructure services to your point about HashiCorp and others. So it's not as clear as infrastructure, platform, SaaS, there's going to be a lot of interplay between these levels of services. Yeah, we are in this sort of flux kind of situation. A lot of developers are lost, a lot of operators are lost in this transition. And it's just like our economy is right now. Like I was reading at CNBC today, there's an sort of headline that people are having a hard time understanding what state the economy is in. So same is true with the, our te technology economy. Like we don't know what state we are in. It's kind of it, it's in the transition phase right now. Well, we're definitely in a bad economy relative to the to the consumer market. We've I've said on the cube publicly, Dave has, as well, not as aggressive. I think the tech is still in a boom. I don't think yeah, there's a tech a bubble at all that's bursting. I think the digital transformation from post COVID is going to continue, and this is the first recession downturn where the hyperscalers have been in market delivering the economic value, almost like they're pumping on all cylinders and going to the next level. Go back to 2008, Amazon Web Services, where were they? Yeah. They were just emerging out. So the cloud economic impact has not been factored into the global GDP relationship. I think all the firms that are looking at GDP growth and tech spend as a correlation are completely missing the boat on the fact that you know, cloud economics and digital transformation 
is a big part of the new economics. So, you know, refactoring business models, this is kind of continuing, and it's just early days. Yeah, I, I have said that many times that, that cloud works good in the bad economy, and cloud works in great in great the, in the good economy, <laughs> right? You know why? Because the, the, there are different type of workloads in in the good economy. A lot of experimentation, innovative solutions go into the cloud. That do you can do experimentation that you have extra money now. But in the bad economy, you don't want to spend the capex mm -hmm. uh, because you have money. Money is expensive at that point, and then you want to leverage. Uh, you want to keep working and you know need off. I think inflation is so, a big factor too and right yeah. now. Well, Sarpi, great to see you. Thanks for coming into our studio for our mm -hmm. stage performance for SuperCloud 22. This is a pilot episode that we're going to get a consortium of experts, Clouderati like yourselves, in the conversation to discuss what the architecture is, what is the taxonomy, what are the key building blocks and what things need to be in, in place for SuperCloud capability because it's clear that if without standards, without de facto standards, we're at this tipping point where if it all comes together, not all one company can do everything. Customers want choice, but they also want to go fast too. Yep. So DevOps is working, it's going to the next level. We see this as super cloud. So thank you so much for your participation. Thanks for having me and I'm, li I'm looking forward to li listen to the other yeah. sessions. We're going to take it session. on asynchronous, we'll take it on the internet. I'm John Furrier, stay tuned for more SuperCloud 22 coverage here at the Palo Alto Studios in one minute.